What you believe about God dictates how you will think. Our philosophies dictate how our culture behaves. Politics is simply the enforcement of cultural norms. The good claims about God, philosophy, culture, and policies will affect what we value. When these things are in alignment, the Bible is possible. But you know what, in, in, in Steve, actually, one of the questions that we were contemplating was how does, uh, how does something like after death get intertwined with government? How can it, how can quote unquote policy potentially be affected by after death? So be thinking about oh, that for a moment. I want you to think about well, it. I, you know, I, I think I've probably talked to you about this, John Arthur, one time, but nobody else. And I've talked about this in, the, in our men's ministry before, and the guys in there know about it. And I don't know if Ed has told you about this, but, you know, and I know all of y'all know this one thing about me, that I've got partial complex temporal lobe epilepsy. Well, one day, and this has probably been, mm, I don't know, four or five years ago or so, I was sitting on the couch, and I had an extreme seizure, and where my limbs locked up and a lot of things, and I just kind of blacked out, and <clears throat> all of a sudden, I was having this experience of all of these hands, these black hands were coming all over me, trying to grab me. Then all of this bright light and this voice comes to me, says, do you actually believe in me? And I knew exactly who it was. He said it again. And I said, I do believe. And he asked me again, and I told him again. And all of a sudden, poof, they were all gone. I could feel warmth of all of this light on me. Then all of a sudden, Back off hmm. and out of all of the seizures I've had over the past 20 years, the first time that has ever, ever, I've never had an experience. never in my life of experience like. So was that was that before or after your salvation experience? After. Okay. Yeah, this was like five years ago, and I have done, you know, I've, man, I, I, and I don't know why, I, I don't know what, what it was that brought that on, but, oh, man, ah. And see, these are, these are things you can't, you cannot sit there and tell somebody they did not have that experience. <clears throat> you can't do that. I mean, I know there's a lot of people who want to dismiss it. But you're dismissing a lot of people. So overwhelming amount. So the, there's a good question in that. There's a good question in that. Are these people just hallucinating? And so I, I actually, I, I know that Mr. Charlie wanted to bring up a cut. If you could bring up the first cut from Mr. Charlie. And so um, this is Dr. Sabom at the beginning of the recorded live stream. And there's, <laughs> there's a key word that he uses in regards to this. Remember, it's early in his uh, start of medical uh, work in, in, in the public. And this is a very interesting comment that he makes here. Go ahead, Mr. Producer. And we'll go to Dr. Long and then, and then John. <laughs> well, this is when uh, I was a cardiology fellow at the University of Florida. And it was a few few months after publication of Life After Life. And there was a woman in the hospital. She was a psychiatric social worker who showed me the book, Life After Life. And the one word that I used that I remember was hogwash. I thought it was <laughs> ridiculous. And she wanted me to go and ask some of my patients whether they had had this experience. 
Uh, well, she twisted my arm long enough, so I did do that. And she had a presentation at a local church, so we included those in the presentation. It went over well. Uh, Sarah and I met together after that, decided to look at this more scientifically than Moody did in his book. And we did a five-year study, interviewed 116 patients, and got the results and published it in 1982. Now, the thing that I think for me... So what's interesting there, he's dealing with a psychiatric person, <laughs> and she wants <laughs> him to start go asking his patients. And he's thinking, <laughs> wait a minute, what in the world? This is a bunch of hooey, and I'm not going to spend my time doing this. And yet, this is what compelled him into near-death experiences and actually eventually led to his salvation. So wow. it, it, and that's a commonality, by the way, that I, I, I'd like to just pull on that thread for just a second. That's a commonality with a lot of these people who go out to disprove Christ. There's mm -hmm. a lot of them that come back as Christians. You look at uh, Case for Christ. I was going to say Lee Strobel. You look at uh, uh, Cold Case Christianity, J. Werner Wallace. You look at uh, Nabil Qureshi. You look at this fellow here, the doctor. You know, th there's a lot going on there. And I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on, on that, Miss Anita, but it seems really interesting how people, when, once they start to pull the thread and it, there, there's just this, there's this interesting thing where it's almost like God's baiting a hook for them to, to chase down. I just find that to be really interesting. Interesting. And um, I appreciate the stance from this movie because they really do a good balance and a good presentation of scientific versus um, experience like that. And the, their whole point is to get you to examine, get you to question. And it was really interesting for me. Um, <clears throat> there's a Korean young man in the movie that slit his throat and uh, stabbed himself in the belly and <clears throat> he was really being demonized to do that and now he's a youth pastor mm -hmm. and i got to meet him and just things like that that uh, the back compelling story just like this um live stream that you're using there are other interviews with key people who produce this movie that is so fascinating makes me have more respect for the movie, the people, and why they got involved. And I heard um, after the movie they had a Q and A panel, and it's not uh, it's not up for to view yet, and I can't wait to see it. But I was so impressed because almost every one to a person said doing this project really increased my. Faith. Miss Anita, you had an opportunity to speak with Doctor Sabom. Uh, at length, um, would you share a few of the compelling things that came out of those conversations? Well, funny thing is, um, he contacted me. Just I didn't know who he was, but uh, now you, in years past, I see how he scientifically continued to question me. Um, he he's very friendly and very. Um, nice to speak with but after we talk three or four times and he's asking me the same questions am i giving the same responses right mm -hmm. and um so even you know he still is in the research mode but the most recent uh conversation i had with him was just a private personal conversation where we're talking about theological things and recommending websites to each other and recommending theological resources to each other. And I just have so much regard for him. You know, the Bible does say you're supposed to search out a matter. I mean, yeah. when people in the scientific world say that Christians are closed minded, that is not true. No. We should be exploring and see. And a lot of things God will reveal to us when we move down that road, when we use the bop, the proper biblical perspective and yeah. willing to inspect yes mm -hmm. yes uh, our experiences it's like i think someone in this group just recently said we can't really know what their experiences are 
and we can't challenge, but we can help them with maybe their interpretation. Mm. Mm. We can help them seek the truth of it because I think sometimes people will get a certain interpretation and that's just where they land forever. Yeah. But maybe you need to challenge your interpretation according to scripture. Is this even a scriptural thing that can happen? Um, it gets challenging because we tend to want to put God in a box. Yeah. That's right. And we, he's and, out of the box in these ways. And a lot of Christians put God in a box. Right. And I think that because can, we yeah. in, embrace a theology that right. says, you, it, you know, absent from the body is present with the Lord. Therefore, you. when you're dead... Uh, you're dead. You're, dead. You. you're not right. coming back. <laughs> well, but had a person just recently say to me, well, you know, I may see the movie because it's interesting, but I don't need to question, uh, is there life after death or what happens? Because a scripture tells me that, and I know what I believe. Oof. Well, fine, but I don't know if, you know, that's kind of off-putting sometimes to others that you're so cut and dried that there's no in between let me uh, john arthur i don't mean to hog the mic you're please, hogging please, the mic. i have to address that situation her? if you're a christian and you think this movie is just well i don't have to go see it because it just does i already believe that you know what there's a lot of things not about you but it's about evangelizing other people would you please get out of the box uh -oh, uh -oh. get out of the she box just started preaching you know what you have something to offer it's not about what you're receiving it's about what you can give out i'm, I'm tired of that come on girl amen <laughs> you know, I, 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 I think you're so passionate over there, Miss Theology. Ooh, yes, you did. Yes, you did. You I live think, with me. I, I think you just uh, you, you both just hit on something that I think is really important. Why should we care? Mm. Why do we care if there is if there's evidence of life after death? Why do we care? So, mm. I, just real quick from the chair of philosophy, I just want to pull pull in on that for just a moment, and I, I want to get y'all's reaction to this, but I want to zoom in for just a moment. Why should we care? Why is this important? Why is it important to have a good eschatology, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding Revelation. Why is that important to look at? Why is it important and to have Ezekiel a good, and Ezekiel uh, mm -hmm. and Zechariah and Why is it important to look at that? And Daniel. And, e exactly. And Matthew. And no one looks at no one looks at Zechariah, by the way. And by the way, that's a 14. really interesting fourteen is such an interesting chapter. And then Mr. Producer is bobbing his head because we, we, we did a the Spirit of the Son of Perdition uh, Bible study one time, and, and he actually took part in that. It was a short three three part Bible study, but it shows that that God God created a a a proxy for Himself, actually Him you know Himself His Son, God the Father sent His Son. Satan made a carbon copy, and he's tried a couple times to do that by inhabiting Judas Iscariot. And some would argue by trying to ha inhabit Napoleon, by trying to inhabit Hitler, by trying to inhabit, and he will inhabit, the, the Antichrist. Satan is creating his mimicry. People don't understand that if they don't look. So why is it important to look at that? Well, A, if you love someone, I'm the only person on this panel who's not, who hasn't been or isn't married. Would you be offended if someone said, Oh, I know that you said that you love me and that you said you whatever. I don't need to know anything else about you. Mm. <laughs> That's a little I, offensive. I, I, wish, I don't yeah. know about that. It, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, uh, I wish I, I, I wish we caught Miss Anita's reaction to that because that was a pretty good reaction. Uh, just what? what? Who you know, would Arthur, say that? I think, I think one of the reasons why we don't, quote unquote, care. Uh, there's a couple i think one is laziness uh, i think that's that's one do you love jesus yeah do but you love jesus go ahead the other one um especially for christians there is a fear of the unknown yep and we we are a little we're careful that we don't want to be uh, found to be wrong in something that we previously see said. Pride. Uh, pride <laughs> comes into play there. I think the other thing, too, is that we're afraid of what we might find out. And it's, it, look. 
Because why? Anything? Why? Why are you afraid of that, what you might find question. out? And let, let me let me tell you why. Let me tell you why I think it, and and, and I, verifiably true. Fact check true. Here we go. You ready? Because if you find something that does not comport with your worldview and your actions, you have to change. If I must yeah. change because of the knowledge that I have, I do not want to hear it. Why well do people stated. say, I do not want to hear about the incoming flood? I do not want to hear about the incoming natural disaster. Why do people say that? Why do people say, people say, hey, get out. Your home's going to flood. I don't want to hear it. This is my home. Right. This is where I am. What are they doing? They're saying, I do not want to leave. And even if I die in bliss, I die in bliss. It goes to that Jew. Ignorance. It goes, yeah, blissful ignorance. Exactly. Yeah. And ignorance is not bliss, by the way. It, it is bliss while you don't know. And then once, once you find out, uh, uh, it's trouble. It's like, it's, it's like that Jew that you were talking about who says, I met Jesus and, yep. I, and I'm going to hunker down. Why? Because it's comfortable. Because you know what it is. And because you don't need to submit to that authority. And that is why you will find Christians at different points in their lives. Some Christians are very... Um, how do I want to say it? Fully engaging in ministry and experiencing God and experiencing and moving forward. And some Christians are stuck and it all has to do with mindset. I can't go across this line. Charlie, when he started the prison ministry, he realized I have to get out of the box. If I'm going to minister to men in the prison of different walks of life and different backgrounds religiously, I have to get out of my mindset. And that was a hard thing because that's what we were, if I could use the term, that's what we were steeped in. Yeah. And that's, I, I will say that it was a freedom moment for me because a lot of spiritual truth really started blossoming more and more. And that was, that was exciting for me. So, well, it's startling to realize that God doesn't have a denominational yeah, name. That's right. Yes, that's right. And uh, something I've been pondering and uh, doing some research for 15 plus years is out of John chapter 3, where Jesus and Nicodemus have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Well, that captured me because why did he use that phrase? Why that analogy? Well, why that those exact words? Why didn't he say saved or redeemed mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. yeah. whatever? But he said born again. And Nicodemus understood him in a manner to reply, uh, do I go back in my mother and come out again? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Jesus said no. And so they were talking about a birth experience. And later in the Gospels, Jesus said to some of the religious mm -hmm. leaders, you are of your father, the devil. So I take that to say Jesus believes there's just two families in the world. It's God's family and there's Satan's family. And because of Adam, we're automatically in Satan's family. So you must be born again into God's family. And, oh, I have so many thoughts about that. But that is, you don't ease into it. You don't float into it. Birth is birth. And conception is when the Holy Spirit knocks on your heart and begins to stir on you and draw you. It's not even about you. It's not about your accepting. It's not about any of that. It is so simple, and I think we've made it very complicated. Mm. Indeed. And, and so I don't want to go too, too far down the rabbit hole. Yeah. But... <laughs> The, 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 for, for, those, for those who are listening, just while we're pulling on that string, when you are born again, what, it, what, what is created? Your a, relationship with God. Yes, but, but the Bible specifically defines it as a new, new creation creature. or a new exactly. creature. What is exactly. that new creature? It's your spiritual, alive, spiritual. A alive through a marriage between you in Christ, a new creation, and that new creation and it's actually a conception. Correct. It's you. You can't it, be a new creation without being conceived. It, it just take yes. it and put it parallel to pregnancy and birth. 
it's it, once you understand that. It's amazing. Once you understand that, and, and so this is, this is how I explain soteriology to people in a short, in a short thing. And, and this is why it's so important. By the way, there's a reason for saying this in the is their Life After Death podcast. Mm -hmm. So, a quick question. Is it, some of you in here have heard me do this before, so I'm going to ask Miss Anita. Uh, it's really important to know this, but what is Jesus' death on the cross? Biblically, what does Jesus' death on the cross have to do with your salvation? I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer that biblically. Because here's a biblical view of soteriology, as best as I can put it. And tell us in the comment section with me but were adam and eve in the garden in genesis 2 were they innocent in genesis 2 before the fall yeah mm -hmm. uh were they clothed were they righteous yep. i would disagree oh and and here's why okay. and here's why <laughs> genesis 3 so, so 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 that's the important thing that's the important thing were they righteous so i would say not biblically the Bible defines Perhaps that there was no need for righteousness. Not yet. Yes. Yes. And so here's, here's where their need comes in. In Genesis 3, the first time that we have recorded that they have a temptation, the first record, maybe there were before, don't know. First time that they, they're, they're tempted, they fall. Are they innocent anymore? What, did they, what is the first thing that they do after they realize? They hide and they attempt to cover. They attempt to clothe themselves. But there's a problem with that. What does God do before they leave the garden? He clothed. With what? With a sacri the, an innocent, he sacrificed an innocent and animal. Them. Yeah. He sacrifices an innocent animal to cover them. Of course, we know that the sacrifices weren't enough. We know that not a single person went to heaven until Christ led captives on his train, gifts mm -hmm. to men coming out of uh, Gehenna. Not, not Gehenna. Gehenna. Uh, uh, a shield. Hades. Shield. So, uh, Hades, correct. So, with that said, when there's a new creation formed, there's a question, how does that work? But let me ask you, are we naked in heaven? Yeah, I don't know. No. The Bible says we are clothed in, in the what? righteousness of Christ. Of Christ. Yeah. We are clothed in the right. That's the picture that God was painting. He was saying, yeah. you must be clothed in the righteousness of an innocent. When you die in this world, you must be clothed in the righteousness of Christ to be able to be in heaven. Right. To stand before God, you have to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ, this new creation. If you realize that it is a birth, you also realize that this is a birth of an eternal creature and there's an eternal nature to this. That's why it's important is there life after? Do you understand why? Because when you can explain it to someone, they understand the importance. Also, by the way, it deals with your issues of can someone lose their salvation? Can someone... Once are you, you going to get unborn? Are you going to get unborn? That's correct. You know. You're born an eternal creature. It's, it's an amalgamation between you and Christ. Your soul, not your flesh, which still, mm -hmm. still misleads you, and Christ form this new creature when you're clothed in his righteousness you know that that's a really interesting uh thing that anita has brought up uh and interestingly enough nicodemus is the one that we studied this last week in in our sunday morning class when you look at the question that nicodemus asked you know must must i enter my mother's womb a second time it's interesting that we as humans, and by the way, uh, you can take a look at a number of the different interactions that Jesus had with people um, in the New Testament, and often he, he will take it from a physical and move it into a spiritual, almost as if that's, we only look at physical. He's dealing with us where we're at and trying to move us to where we need to be. And when you take a look at his question, he obviously knew exactly what he was talking about. Nicodemus could not comprehend that. And, well, and I think it's short-sightedness on our part. It's just not, we're not equipped because of the fall of man. Well, we're not equipped to really grasp it right away. Let me come at it from a slightly different perspective. Mm -hmm. Why, 
why are why is our world have the parallels with the metaphysical world mm. why did god decide for man to have this 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 act of uh consummation of marriage that produces a child why is there a nine month carry time for the child mm. why there is a reason why God designed the world. And if, if you take John 1 literally and Genesis 1 literally, the world was manifested when God spoke the word, his son, and the, 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 the universe was formed out of the essence and nature of God. That's why the rules and laws of nature have a conformity to logic, to reason. Righteousness yields fruit. Evil yields death. There's a reason why those things happen. It's because this world is a manifestation. The perfect world or the good world that was created is a manifestation of the mind of God. Just like a good painting is a manifestation of what the painter has seen. They paint from reference. They're seeing something in their mind. God, when he manifested this world and he said it was good, it was a manifestation of what God thought was good and beautiful. And it came out of that. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus had those saying, he's giving us a look into why he himself manifested the world the way it was. By the way, that gives us, a, a, there is a birth and there is an eternal life. Yep. And that is why it is important to know, is there life mm -hmm. after death? Good stuff. Mr. Charlie, I know you had one more uh, uh, cut that you wanted to reach and it was uh 3530, so cut number two, two, Mr. Producer. Pull that up for us. And for those that are listening, this is really to help provoke the question, can it be true? Go ahead. Uh, above and beyond that, we've had people born totally blind that have had highly visual near-death experiences. Physical brain function cannot explain that. We have scores of near-death experiences that occurred with the heart stopping, complete cardiac arrest while they were under general anesthesia. Uh, under general anesthesia, you can't have a conscious experience. After your heart stops, you can't have a conscious experience. This group of experiences, near-death experiences under general anesthesia, are doubly impossible to be due to uh, uh, physical brain function. And let's not forget what Dr. Sabom was saying earlier, that so-called out-of-body experience, consciousness apart from the body. Yes, I agree, it's the soul. But what you can see and hear during a near-death experience, uh, if you cut, when they come back and check it out later, is almost invariably accurate down to fine details, even if they have that out-of-body experience, consciousness apart from the body, and they're observing things far from the physical body, far out of any geographical sensor, sensory awareness at all. We've had people bring back, uh, many, many people bring back accurate observations, hundreds of yards, even over a mile away from their physical body during the near-death experience. Good, Pinpoint at That's so important. Th that is huge. That is absolutely huge. Um, especially when you're talking about people that are blind. How does a blind person see the things that are around them? Uh, it, you'd have a very hard time refuting um, this kind of thing. I talked about the woman that uh, was, was floating out of her body, and she observes things that only she could know. I'll give you an example. She gave the detailed markings on the top of the ambulance. She was on the first floor. She didn't see no top of ambulance. She hadn't climbed up on it earlier. That's that's the kind of thing that you're talking about. And there's other compelling things. Uh, 30 degrees going 30, 30 different generations. I mean, that that's pretty incredible. You know, a lines away from the family. So... You know, it's stuff like that that I, I hope, uh, again, if you're really nervous about seeing the movie, uh, that's okay. Um, I would urge you to take a look at the recorded live stream and some of these other things that we've been talking about. There'll be other ones. Angel Studios, you can Google that. You can get online. They'll, they'll have links to that material. Uh, we are going to include the link to the recorded live stream. Uh, for you that's in the in the details below but 
If you're nervous about going and seeing the movie, go ahead and give the recorded live stream a look. It's an hour long, and I promise you, you will not be bored. You will and, not and be don't no. think And don't think that there's something that spoils your enjoyment That's for the right. movie. Absolutely no, it enhances. Not. Yes. Correct. Yes. So I, I just want to say thanks to all you guys for jumping in on this uh, podcast. I said this earlier. I'll say it again. I would not be a bit surprised if this is one of the most watched podcasts that we have done because this, this is a, uh, man, I'm, I'm hesitant to use this term. This is a pop culture issue. You know, we turn on the news and we look at Israel, Hamas, we look at transgender, we look at all those different things, and those are important things. Please don't get me wrong. But behind every single person that walks this earth, most every one of them will ask the question, where did I come from? Watch this. Where am I going to? And... It's our desire to, to provoke you to think about the material that's been presented today and to give this uh, careful consideration. Absolutely. Most assuredly. Absolutely. So just some final, some final questions for going around the room here. So what does the Bible speak to with the idea of after death? We, we, we've heard some of the verse there. Well, let me just give you a synopsis. I'll, I'll share the verses, but I won't read them all. Um, and I need to lay the foundation. Uh, in Luke chapter 16, 19 through 29, it talks about the certain rich man yeah, who died and then Lazarus who died. And the rich man was put in torment and Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom and he was comforted. But they could see each other. And... Um, Abraham's bosom is also known as paradise. Well, when Paul has his out of body experience and he's caught up, he says he, um, he was caught up into paradise. That means that from the belly of the, of the earth, the paradise moved from there to heaven. I think that's important to understand. That happened after Christ rose from the dead because he led captivity captive. Those who were captive in the uh, in the paradise were caught up to heaven after the after Christ resurrected so and then you have the experience of Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 6 7 and 8 where he's talking about um, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body we are absent from the Lord but we are confident I say willing rather to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord and then Paul says in Philippians, for I am a, um, in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So I just wanted to establish where we get the idea of that we die and we go to heaven. And, and these are the verses that are some foundational. You know, outside of Lazarus, Paul probably the next closest person to totally experiencing death and coming back. So I would say uh, we have both Elijah, Ezekiel. Yeah, New mm -hmm. Testament. Yeah. I'm, I was speaking of New Testament, but yes. But yes. To, to your point, Old and Testament, you, absolutely. And help me with the name, but there was the group when they were in the desert. Moses was in the desert and they were rebellious against Moses. Correct. Okay, and so the earth opened up and swallowed them up. I mean, they went straight to hell. <laughs> I mean, there was, you know. Yeah. So, so there are different, there are, there are places in here to prove that there's life. And, and, and also that, be, so the, I've, I've been, this was drilled into my head as a kid, to be absent with the body, from the body is to be present with the mm -hmm. Lord. That's not what the Bible says. Specifically, that's a quote of Second Corinthians five, um, five eight, and just to to kind of pull that out, I'm going to pull up the Bible verse here. Oops. All right. Let's see if we're all right over there. Yep. Technical gonna, difficulty. <laughs> so here is here is the verse here. <laughs> we are confident. I say rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That's not what. What Paul's saying is that we are confident and we're willing to be absent from the body 
and then to be present with the Lord. In that same letter, what does he say? 14 years ago, I know not when. Right. I'm caught up into the spirit or, you know, in, in, into the third heaven. So that context does not mean, so people say to be absent from the body of the Lord, death is absence from the Lord. That's not what the Bible says. So for, for those of you who are fundamentalists, by the way, I came from a very, very, very much a fundamentalist background. And they're done that. It's not biblical. Take your theology books and burn them. And then when you get done burning them, pick up the one thing that you should have read in the first place, which is the Bible. Mm. And if any of the value from the theology makes sense with the Bible, then you can explore it through the lens of the Bible. Uh, you know, Mr. Producer said this one time, he says, you know, some people come to the Bible with the, with the lens yep. of, a, of a commentary and it messes with their heads. Yes. So you haven't quite given you haven't so you said that that's not what that means but you haven't given a definition of what it does it mean. So what does it mean? It says I in 58. So that's a good question. In 58 I'll read the verse one more time. So we are confident I say and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. What Paul is saying is there is short time on this earth to win souls and to glorify God. So I am confident that when I am absent from my body, I will eventually be. That's not even what he's saying. He's saying I am willing to be absent from the body and to be present from the Lord. Those are two different things. Those are two different things. To be absent from the body does not mean that you are with the Lord. But he wants to be absent with the body and to be present with the Lord. Okay, so are you saying that there are those that are lost who are absent from the body and will not be present with the Lord? That kind of where you're going? I think this goes that, to it, the... That, that, th those two are not... So we're making connected. an assumption that when I read this, I'm just thinking of Christians. And you're saying we should not make that assumption because then a non-Christian can say, well... I died, so now I'm present with them. That's not even right. what I'm saying, but you are 100% correct that that is, that is the problem with the fundamentalist thing. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The Bible doesn't say that. It says, no. Paul is saying, I am willing to be absent from the body. I'm willing to depart from this earth and to be present with the Lord. Those two aren't connected because some people are absent from the body for a short amount of time, but their spirit has not been caught up. God does not call them. But then some of them also go to hell and they're not, they're not present with the Lord. They're, they're in death and Hades and they're not present with God. So to be absent from the body is not necessarily to be present with the Lord. The assumption and the main, the almost always the exception with exception, with small exceptions. If you're a Christian, you can take this to be when I die, I will be present with God. That is true. Your body might be dead and God may say, it is not your time. Go back and you will not, you are not going to depart from this world. Because he says, it also says in the Bible, uh, it is appointed for man once to die and then the resurrection. Well, the that judgment. didn't, or, sorry, then the judgment. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Some of them are me. down there, you know, treading flames to stay afloat in the, like a fire. Yeah, yeah, I'm not know. sure. I'm not sure if they can tread even, but yeah, it's yeah, a but terrible that's picture. That's what they're trying to do. It's a terrible so, picture. Yeah. So w with that said, that is really, really an important distinction is that you can have a near-death experience. It does happen. It is real. So just pulling in from the chair philosophy here, why should it matter? This is, again, Mr. Mr. Charlie was the one who wrote this. Why should it matter if we believe in life after death? What are some of the dangers of the different views? So this is a question that, that he wanted to answer. And so anyone in, in here heard of annihilationism? A show mm -hmm. of hands? Yep. Anyone heard of that? Okay. What is annihilationism? Yeah. The belief that you cease to exist. Well, I, I mentioned it earlier in the podcast, in part one of this podcast. Annihilationism doesn't work because it says the smoke of their torment will go up before the Lamb and his angels forever and ever in Revelations 14, 9, I believe. That is not an annihilation. By the way, that should make every single one of us more urgent, yeah, yeah. more urgent in our tenor 
with the unbeliever. Okay, that's one. Two, the idea that all dogs go to heaven. That there's a that there's huh? a universalist. There's a universalist. I disagree. Thing. <laughs> and, and 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 I know Mr. Palmer was temporary. So you're a mostly mostlist. And there are some dogs that deserve to go to hell. <laughs> so the idea that all people just okay, j- 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 just in case we you know what not 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 your dogs. Your dogs are going to hell. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. My dogs are going to hell. did. Mr. Producer's like eh. okay, but. That idea goes in the face of, in the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. I, I'm not basing my, 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 my view of hell based on that one verse, but it is an important verse. It says that all of those who worship the beast hmm. and took his mark will be thrown in. There is a place, there is a place where you will not enjoy, where the worm doesn't die, where it's eternally dark and where there's flames. How all of that makes sense, it doesn't. I think there's a literal place, but I think it's so much worse than you could possibly imagine. Mm. And and the state is terrible, so it does matter what you think about that. Yeah. And we really should be urgent about it. And so, to, 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 to your point, Miss Anita, I think when we have people who have lost the narrative, and they, there's no interest. And it's almost, it's a, it's a form of apathy. Mm. Right. And, yes. and I, I think that that's sad. So, just kind of moving into that, why should people go and, and video on demand this or watch it in theaters if it's still playing when this airs? Why should people go and see the After Death movie? Well, what, I think it important? stirs up your curiosity for one thing. If you haven't thought about it at all, then it's interesting. It's, you know, unique. So I can see where yeah, people might not have any feeling about it one way or the other. But if they, they will not come out unchanged. You'll, you'll be challenged hmm. to think you'll be challenged to consider and that's the whole point that was their whole point i know the film has been criticized for not giving an open call to salvation or whatever but that was not their point yeah i'm, I'm sorry some christians are just philistines they right. cannot i mean god uses all kind of things and i think this is a very evangelistic movie that would speak to someone who is not a believer and really stir up their curiosity and that is the point yeah make them question yeah. a, a, a big not just a small question right. but a big bold question yeah. mark. So, is is their life after death right what it, happens after death no and that's the important and only the bible speaks to the truth of it yes yes and exactly that, that, that's what i was about to ask you yeah. that, that, that that that's the importance of this isn't it yeah it, it, is is that there is a there is a god there is an afterlife mm-hmm. and scientifically we're now seeing it's not just one set of hallucinations these all line there there's there's a structure there's a common thread to them there's a common thread and it's not just an evolutionary thing by the way no. we don't believe in evolution here but I'm, but <clears throat> the response would be there's an evolutionary response and by the way watch the video they they have a thing of joe rogan and uh Shermer. wow that was a it, and opener. and and Shermer goes mm-hmm. well you know it, it's hallucination at right. the end and and, yeah. and just to, to describe the endorphin rush and right. they, they speak to this the endorphin rush lasts for two minutes or, or three minutes it's a runner's high. You would get over that. Not 47 minutes like my father was yep. dead on the slab. Yep. Dead. That is not mm-hmm. what that is. That, so that's when you have the scientific community ignoring the evidence for their yep. naturalistic worldview. So we have the science. But one of the things that... that um, uh, Mr. Pomeroy, you know, and, and I were wanting to ask Steve in the political chair, just wrapping up, mm-hmm. is there the potential with policy on what research is done and what research is allowed to be done for the government to twist or suppress that evidence? And how have we seen that sort of happening towards uh, uh, no way back or severely injured people. Does anyone here remember Terry Schiavo? Yeah, I was going to say Terry Schiavo was 
uh, your poster child. How how is the government? How should we as Christians influence the government on that? Well, you know, I think as Christians, you know, we're out there to create disciples, and there is a time that, like like we've said here and discussed, that there's a point in time where the the soul leaves the body and does not cross, make that crossover path. And we have numbers of doctors, like we've heard right here, that know that that occurs. And there are those that, or people that, you know, have signed waivers for organ donation. Okay, and one of the things with some of these doctors is is they want to get your organ as soon as possible. Now, are they taking a organ from someone who's not possibly dead? Mm-hmm. And what they've done is actually injured someone, injured someone, and caused them to die. Crossover when Jesus wasn't wanting them to. <coughs> I mean, it, you know, that, that's mm. a question to think about or take their heart or their liver or kidney or whatever the it may be. I mean, that's something to consider. And we need to think about these sort of things because, you know, there's a point in time where people that are Christians are going to stand up for these sort of things. And you've got to th consider, hey. Just because that person died on the table doesn't mean they're dead. That's like with Anita's husband praying over this man. You know, he didn't die. Yeah, there's there's actually evidence. Your to suggest, father. There's evidence to suggest that there are people who have been harvested while the heart was beating. There is evidence to suggest that. Exactly. There, there are multiple stories of this. And... To me, that, man, that just, you know, that, I don't know we about that sort of thing. Fine. That's just we need to protect completely people from that. unethical. And there's government things that protect these doctors from those sort of things. Yeah. That is not right. And so it, it, is and, there an economic incentive? Oh, my gosh, yes. It's a good, it's a, it's a good segue to the, to the chair it, of uh of economics to just, wrap up. Just one point I'd like to say, though. It. I did not have <clears throat> an illusion or anything when I had that experience because I can tell you this. My step youngest stepson was there when that occurred, and he told me that I had a seizure for 15 minutes wow. that it was going on. And I'll tell you what, that experience seemed like it lasted for like less than a minute to me. But the seizure lasted 15 <laughs> minutes. Mm. Sir. Now that, it wasn't no dopamine high or anything like that. I no. can tell you something. No. I believe it. I believe it. So it, moving on to the chair of economics. There is an economic incentive there. And, and so what, what are some of the connections between life after death and, and the economy? And what should the Christian be aware of? You know, it's, when it comes to, let's talk mortuaries. Is there one there? Well, <coughs> I, don't, I don't know as there is one there. Um, I mean, because we all, we all die at some point, right? So that's the one side. But the other side is interesting in terms of the issue of organ harvesting. Um, and boy, there's a topic that we could do on a podcast. Yep. Um, if there was an economic issue, it, it might be that one. But we'll say in, in addition to what Steve has brought out, when it comes to getting grants, um, pertaining to research into this kind of thing you're not getting no money for that they're dry because what's the religion of the state yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so that i would say that politically there's 
I won't call it censoring, direct censoring. I'll call it indirect censoring to keep you from getting to a point where you could publish something. Um, but in terms of the economics, outside of organ harvesting, I'm not sure there is any other one. Organ harvesting is an important one, no doubt. But um, I would call that more of a, I'm going to call that more of an underground market that is starting to become more of above ground. Indeed. Indeed. And on the, on the note yeah. of economics, the one thing that we, that we often talk about here is the value of human life, mm. the value of spiritual life. Yes. So make sure that you are investing into the life of someone because there's only a matter of time before they pass. And by the way, it says that uh, he who wins souls to heaven, you know, is wise. It's wise. There's also, you know, there's a lot of value in God's sight uh, for you doing that. So make sure that that's what you're about. With that said, thank you for listening and watching to this two-part podcast. Uh, like, comment, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Like we said early in the first part of this podcast, uh, the first week that this played, looks like YouTube has uh, writ lifted the band. Awesome. Thank you for hanging around. By the way, thank Ooh. you for over 200,000 downloads on audio. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So thank you guys for uh, listening. Uh, please keep sharing anywhere where podcasts are listened to and Rumble, almost uh, 90 uh, subscribers. All right. So some of those videos on Rumble have really taken off. Black Hebrew Israelites are really interested in. Yeah. Um, and I will say this, uh, folks, if you are trying to watch on Rumble, um, you really need to go to the channel yeah to look for the videos don't do i've tried this and doing a search and their search engine is not near as good they're working on it yeah they're working on it actually but i just want to point people to the channel you'll you'll find the videos there actually starting to do uh work some work with her for another for a client of mine so maybe we'll we'll have a talk with them man i would love to you know nice. anyway yeah. we'll, 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 but you can we'll get it there you can but yeah, it yep. look it up at uh, at Further Every Day. And by the way, on the X, which we can't call it Twitter anymore, it's the X, the uh, X at Twitter. Further Every Day. Uh, no, X. Elon Musk assassinated Twitter. He killed the bird. He shot it with his BB gun, and he planted X on the uh, corpse of it. And X that is that's where we are. Yeah, he put an X on the spot. So at Further Every Day, look at the shenanigans from Clint and I over there. With that said, thank you so much for listening. We love you. Talk we got nothing else for you. Have a good day. Bye. 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 Okay, last thing. Last thing. If you're still here, okay. we put you to sleep or you are a super listener. Going around the room, we did not do anything for the first part of this, but for the second part, I want to ask you, how do you want to die? Oh, in my wow. sleep. Actually, I don't want to die. I want to go in the rapture. Okay. That's a fair answer. How do you want to die? Fast. Fast. <laughs> That's fair. I would like, actually... <coughs> I'd like to be sitting in my tree stand and get caught up in the rapture while I'm sitting there in my tree stand. That is very specific. Nice and a, that is exactly what I, yeah, I, I like that. Uh, I yeah. like that. Rapture, man. All the grandkids around, all the kids around. Everybody Let's go together. Up, we're going. I love it. So <laughs> yeah. I, while, while, while I would like the rapture, I've always imagined ever since I was five. So I, I, I would, we would listen to stories of the martyrs. Oh, wow. And so oh, I have wow. always wanted to die with my boots on, uh, yeah. Yeah. doing something for God. I've always wanted to die with my boots on. Uh, that's not an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. You got no, tennis shoes on say, right now. He just wanted to live till he died. There hey, you go. I, I, I totally agree with that. And I, that's what happened for him. I want to die with my boots on, doing something for God. Uh, if I die in my sleep or die in the rapture, I will not, I will not be offended. Thank you, Lord. But if I die with my boots on uh, and it's something that's meaningful for the gospel, I would love that. But that said, yeah. tell us how you want to die. And just remember, it's not an invitation. Uh, tell us in the comment section. Oh, wait, wait, Mr. Producer, how, how do you want to die? Rapture or sleep, as he says. Okay, uh, tell us in the comment section if you agree with, with Mr. Producer or if you agree with me or if you agree with Mr. Steve there. Because <laughs> uh, the comments and consensus is rapture or sleep. Love you all so much. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.